Marshall, and our company is Box Mercury. Now, before we get started, has anyone seen the movie Pan's Labyrinth by chance? Well, for those who haven't, it's a horror movie that was made a couple decades ago, and back then it was extremely expensive to make movies in multiple languages. So, most people watch now by it in Spanish with subtitles such as English. And when I watched this as a kid, the thing that stood out to me is there was a monster and it was in Spanish. And that's about it. That's all I really remember from it. And being a kid, when you're watching a horror film, you should be focused on the picture itself and that being captivating. But unfortunately, you're focused on the words and you're trying to, try to figure out what's going on by looking at the bottom of the screen in order to understand what the actors are saying. Well, here at Vox Mercury, we want to make sure that that isn't a reality anymore, and that those labor costs and all of those predicaments and circumstances surrounding um, dubbing into another language aren't uh, something that stops you from making your content more available to a wide range of cultures and uh, countries. So here at Vox Mercury, we create an AI dubbing service where we use an AI algorithm that models all different languages in a fraction of the time and a fraction of the cost so you're able to get your film out to a wider audience and increase your revenue. So looking over, our problem is traditional dubbing. Now traditional dubbing is slow because it's, um, it's handled by a third party firm that the production studio hires. So you're seeing things where they own a monopoly of the share of the movie industry, so they're gonna be demanding a huge cost for their services. They're working with a wide range of actors from multiple languages, multiple, act, uh, multiple characters. And so you're seeing a huge problem where you, can, you have to devote a lot of time and money and resources in order to get your movie out. And here, with our company, Box Mercury, we kind of attack all of those pain points of it's extremely expensive, it takes months or weeks just to do one film, and it requires a lot of people. So with our system just focusing on primarily all of those pain points, our pain points are really only down to what idioms do we have to focus on? What little red flags are causing our system to be held up so we can get this out to our customers as fast as possible? And just to reiterate that, this is our, what we offer. So the, these are the, the pain points that we solved. Sorry about that. Looking at the market size, we have 189 billion market size. This is what our customer cares about, such as DreamWorks, Disney, Universal, Warner Brothers. This is the market that they're trying to capture. And what we're trying to capture is the $3.5 billion industry that is dubbing. And so this is our available market, our total market that we're trying to capture. And looking at our market share, we have a 50% market share, which is 1.75 billion. And while that sounds like a lot, 50% market share is quite a bit. Um, we're going to be focusing our first couple years on targeting small uh, production studios and film industries, such as ones that showcase at Sundance Film Festival, in order to build a reputation and to eventually market to bigger ones, such as Universal. Now we'll be moving on to Nate, who will be covering customer segments. Thank you, Jack. As he explained briefly, I'm here to talk about the customer segments. The customer segments are broken into two major categories. First is the majors. These are your major movie producers, stuff that comes to mind of DreamWorks and Warner Brothers. They often have a high volume production. They also have high budgets for their movies. But their pain points come that they want to be able to deliver a single finalized product to their customers with no questions. Box Mercury will solve that problem by taking all labor pains of dubbing off their shoulders. They will hand it to us, tell us the languages they want it dubbed in, and it will be done. The next customer is the streamers. These are streaming services. Ones that come to mind are Netflix and Hulu. The benefit of this customer, or these types of customers, is they have a global reach already. They're already targeting audiences outside of the United States. But their pain point comes from subscriber retention. And they want to increase that number and keep it more consistent and increasing month to month. We're going to help them solve that problem by decreasing the lead time in dubbing movies. This will allow them to better schedule the release of their films 
to spread them out in a schedule that increases subscriber retention. Next, we have the business model. Box Mercury has two business models that they will run. The first being a flat rate of $208 per minute, per movie, per language. An average movie will run for two hours, and an average series will run for five hours, assuming a 10 episode series at half an hour each. With these numbers in this rate, this gives us an average on return of $125,000 per movie or $312,000 per series. The second business model is a royalty-based model. By increasing the number of languages that a movie can be dubbed into, the average revenue of these films in series will increase. The royalty model will then take a 45% royalty from this increase. So an example is if the movie has a revenue of $10 million, by increasing the number of languages, we will increase the revenue by $3 million, and Box Mercury will take a cut or a royalty of $1.35 million. Next, Shana will talk about market adoption. Okay. So Box Mercury, uh, our market adoption strategy has three main points. First, uh, to gain initial exposure, we're gonna be demonstrating our technology at uh, large industry events. This includes CinemaCon, Sin Europe, and Sundance. Um, at these uh, events, we'll gain customers, and each customer is going to receive a personalized customer experience. Uh, this is because our highly trained service force um, is going to make sure that they're with them every step of the way, uh, quickly and thoroughly answering any questions and seeing to all of their needs. Uh, through this service, we're hoping to gain a very prestigious reputation that will inevitably unlock more uh, connections within the industry. So now you know how we're gonna take over the market, but what is the market right now? So our competition, Our competition uh, right now mostly is traditional dubbing. Uh, so in the lower left corner here you see Ball Media and Gotham Labs are a couple of those companies. Now their product uh, hires actors and has a very long lead time as my colleagues mentioned. Uh, so it is high cost and if you've ever experienced traditional dubbing it, you know that it's pretty low value. Uh, there are a few AI dubbing companies in the market right now. Um, uh, a lot of them are direct to customer. Um, so our biggest competitor within the entertainment industry and large production films is gonna be Deep Dub AI. Uh, so what they do is they actually provide a service of a software. Uh, so they just hand the software over to the production company. They use that software with their own labor uh, to create the final product. However, uh, for a slightly higher cost, but a much higher value, uh, Vox Mercury is not only going to do the AI dubbing service, but we will implement a mouth matching technology to give a more realistic feel to uh, the films. And on top of that, we're going to provide our customers with a finished product rather than just uh, uh, giving them a, the software because we are a service company, not a software company. Um, and so you've met some of them already, but I'm just going to uh, give you a better introduction to our management team at Box Mercury. So the heart and soul of our company is our founder and CEO, Christian. Uh, we also have Jack Marshall, who is our CMO. Uh, Nate is our CFO. And uh, my name is Shana, and I am the uh, CTO, Chief Technology Officer. Uh, we've chosen each one of these members of our management team because they embody the values of our company which is the ambition to build a company using brand new state-of-the-art technology, the tenacity to claim our part of a multi-billion dollar global market, and the empathy to the end customer who just wants to have a little more access to entertainment and film. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to our CEO. Thank you, Shana. Hello everyone, my name is Christian Landrell. I am the founder and CEO of Vox Mercury. So I'm going to be going over the financial projections with y'all. So initially we anticipate a slow sales volume as we're trying to attend more trade events and get our 
brand and name out there and make more industry connections. So for the first two years, we anticipate pretty slow sales volume, especially in the series sector. That's because for television series, like with streaming customers, it's not so direct where if we get more dubbing, they immediately get more sales. It's more of volume for them. How many shows and how many different languages can they offer? That's why customer retention is so important for them. Uh, so our financial model anticipates an EBITDA of $25 million by year five. For those who aren't in the know, EBITDA is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. For the purposes of this, you can think of it as like net profit. And a lot of our costs up front for the first year is going to go to our sales and development team, as well as covering the legal fees for our legal counsel. We anticipate a pretty quick ramp up by 2025 in our revenue and our sales volume, and we think that's going to show up a lot for our investors. So, Fox Mercury is doing AI dubbing services, not just software. We're asking for a $1.7 million seed investment for a 30% share of our company. We're seeded in a sizable market of $3.5 billion for dubbing, and that's anticipated to grow year over year by 7.5%. So by 2027, you can anticipate a market of about five and a half billion dollars. Our MVP timeframe is about quarter three of 2024. So it'll take us about eight months to come up with a finished product that we can use to start selling to customers. Our year five EBITDA is anticipated for $25 million. And for the investors in the room, this means they can expect a return by year five of 4.5 times their initial investment. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate all of you being here. Any questions? Yeah. Um, so I was curious, there's a slide where it said that um, you're gonna charge 45% on the um, the profit gain from your dubbing services. That to me seems really high. Is that like a standard or like where'd you get that number? So we figure it's gonna be kind of a little bit of a tricky sell in the beginning. And so we expect that the smaller production houses that are maybe expecting like $500,000 to a million dollars in revenue for a film aren't gonna to wanna to put like 125 grand into dubbing. And so for them, it's a easier model for them to take on so that they don't have any upfront costs. For them, it's all about we succeed when they succeed. So 45% I think is pretty fair, seeing as we're gonna be generating a bunch of excess revenue they otherwise wouldn't have. And it's just 45% of that extra revenue. Yeah, so. Not the, what they would have made normally. Yeah, so we're taking a 45% cut of the extra revenue to generate them. Cool. Yeah. So along with that, how are you measuring the extra revenue that they would have Because their revenue hopefully that will be increasing at the same time as so we took the industry averages for the film's uh, revenue for like the larger studios to be about like ten million dollars, and we just kind of expected that we our value add would be about thirty percent increased revenue for our customers. So it's just kind of like a generalized number that we put to it. Um, and with that, you can think with like uh, movies that are be on like streaming platforms and stuff. You can tell where like what the demographics are and the people watching it and where around the world they're buying them. And you can even monitor what kind of uh, dubbing they're choosing when they're watching the film. So that way you can kind of track and measure exactly which customers are, um, would have not originally purchased the film. Yeah. Um, I feel like there's a really big issue that wasn't touched on this presentation. Mm -hmm. And that is like the writer's strike that just happened. And it was, Largely centered around AI, and that's even now jobs. So I think it'd be interesting to see how you guys would navigate that kind of um, problem that you have to your business. Totally makes sense that that's something that'll come up. Um, so the ride strike actually just recently ended. It did. Um, yeah, but their thing was on generative text AI for creating scripts. Ours is focused more on just creating the translations. For the dubbing, so I mean, writers specifically wouldn't, I can't imagine, would have too yeah, much like involved. The, the, like the voice actors. Voice actors for that's like SAG-AFTRA, Screen Actors Guild. Um, yeah, so for them, 
that is something that we've taken into consideration. We would that's why a lot of our upfront costs would be legal fees because we want to make sure that they're reimbursed for their uh, their likeness because obviously it would be their voice on the screen just in a different language. And we want to make sure that we're doing the ethical thing and empathizing with everyone, all the key stakeholders involved. Go for it. So one thing that I have a question on is early on in your presentation, you said that your your first customers would be kind of the small 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 guys, people presenting films at like Sundance or whatever. But then your customer segments didn't touch on that group at all, or at least weren't mentioned. You have the majors, like you talk about the big movie studios and the streamers, and then you only mentioned two of the big streamers, Netflix and Hulu. Mm -hmm. So. My question is, are you targeting the small guys or are you just going after those big fish? They're still We're, part of the same customer yeah. segments, it's just on a relatively smaller scale in terms of profit. But they outline the same values and what we're presenting them and what they can um, expect in return. Okay. But, like our key customers are the big guys though, because they're the ones that are making the most revenue. So we want to go for them and it's kind of, I feel like an easier sell because with smaller films, especially like a foreign film, it's unlikely that they're gonna get a lot of press and marketing and be able to have a high sales volume. But with like, if Disney was able to do their show in Spanish, it was like almost guaranteed there'd be a customer base that would wanna watch it in Spanish or Chinese. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yep. You mentioned some of these really compelling questions is like, well, like a mouth matching technology. I know that's sort of like a pain point. Like that's where I just lose the stuff. I'm like, okay, yeah. So what is that? Is that something that's, that you've developed already, or can you say more about that? So this is something that we hope to develop. It's just using kind of like, if you think of like deep fake technology with CGI, we'd be able to transpose new mouth and lip movements to kind of match the target language. That's something that's already, a technology that's already like around, people just kind of haven't really pieced it together super well, at least not in the way that we're trying to do it with films. They usually do it for like short form content, like you watch like presidents play video games on YouTube or something. But um, for movies, it's not something that's really been included at all. Yeah. Uh, I didn't want to take Isaac's uh, question, and, but in your, right, away, uh, right away, there is already a product that is also a deep fake, a more um, deep fake mouth moving within the language type of thing. It does it with like, short videos and all of that. Um, that's not my question, but. Uh, um, I noticed that um, three of you guys are mechanical engineers, and I'm not sure if you have like coding experience. How do you go about developing this type of software and release it towards uh, your customers? So that's a good question. Uh, we're the management team, and so our initial year one uh, cost would be about $500,000 to hire uh, AI-specific software engineers. Um, so they would be covering a lot of that kind of route. Um, mechanical engineers are just kind of like the best of the engineers. So we figured that would be the best way to uh, have us up at the top managing the software guys. <laughs> yeah. Going back to uh, the revenue and in particular the royalty model. Yeah. Um, when you guys are considering like taking that royalty, did you do any sort of comparative analysis between like current costs? what the pricing model is for those dubbing services compared to like the retained customers, like those demographics, the numbers behind that. Are you talking about like the churn rate for streamers kind of thing? So like customer um, retention with the Yeah, numbers? yeah, for streamers in particular. Yeah. We actually have I'm glad you asked that because I do so much work on that. Yes, so the industry average churn rate is about forty percent yearly for streamers like Netflix, which means every year they lose 40% of their customers and they have to spend many billions of dollars in marketing to get them back. And we kind of modeled out that we would anticipate about reducing that by a flat 5%, so it would be reducing from 40 to 35, and that would save them about $720 million every year. That would be our big value proposition for them. Does that answer your question? Yep. Solid. Yeah. Um, I have a question about the royalty where you said that you'd uh, taken it out, I think it was $1.35 million off of, um, and so that then the people who paid million would make it $1.75 million, or regardless. What, what makes you think that you'd be so sure that you'd take that much of a percentage of their profit that they made from their film? Or what, why do you think you'd 
is it forty five percent is what you take from the revenue? From the additional from the revenue. revenue. Yeah. yeah. So we think that would be pretty fair because it's say they say it is a big film, they make a they expect a base revenue about ten million dollars. Right. And we generate them three million extra dollars. Mm -hmm. For us, we think it's a fair bargain as far as for our value capture to do 45% because that's an extra at one point, like seven, five million dollars they otherwise would not have gotten. Is this, uh, in the, this is assuming that the company already advertises this film in those countries not done? Hmm. Um, could you rephrase that a little bit? Like, in the, you're now uh, showing a movie in a country that, where it's not in the native language. So would it already be advertised? Like, like the Marvel movies are, uh, I'm assuming they're mostly dubbed at this point, but like they're shown across the country, but in, con in locations where the language is not spoken, and if it was shown in English, is they, do they advertise it there? Or if, if it were dubbed, and they were to show the movie there, now would they have to go through all the advertising and be like, this movie's now known to you in your name? Oh, I see, I see what you mean, yeah. So for some company, for movies that have like already been released, they would do a new re-release and have to, to start a new marketing campaign in that region which is not the best kind of uh, hope we would have, but we would want to work with the companies right off the bat with the start of a movie so they can already kind of pre-plan right. what their marketing is going to look like. All right, so they already have the advertising in place for, uh, for another country that's in the movie. Yeah, okay. definitely. And they're already doing that currently for whoever they work with right now with traditional right. dubbers. It's just that we'd be doing this and we'd push it out a little bit quicker. So the timeline would just be moved up. Okay, cool. You got one? Yeah, so I can see how your revenue model works great for box office films, but I have a few questions in relation to streaming services. So mm -hmm. if you take Netflix, for example, they make some of their own films, and then sometimes they have other studios make those films and then they purchase them. Would you be working more with Netflix, or would you be working more with the studios? And then my next question is, you said it takes about half a million dollars to get an AI vending service. What stops Netflix, after you're successful, from hiring similar AI engineers and just making the same exact service that you do and just dubbing all of their films themselves? That's a good question. Um, so for, I'll address that one first. Uh, for them, it takes a lot of resources. Um, for instance, when um, back before companies were able to like, uh, like have servers kind of built up easily, like, so initially companies used to have these huge networks of servers that they had to manage on their own and dedicate human capital and dollar resources to managing, it's a huge pain. It's logistically kind of a massive uh, chore. And they a lot of companies would rather offload that and save their costs and the personnel and just pay another company to take care of it. Um, especially with like bureaucracies, like you can never underestimate a person's willingness to spend someone else's money to solve a problem. Um, what was, can you repeat the first question? Oh, the first question was be, would you work more with streamers or production studios? Oh, thanks. Uh, so initially, we expect more so with the production studios, um, like, like Warner Bros, Disney making films, because I think it's an easier sell as far as the financial mo modeling goes. Um, with streamers, it's, like I was saying before, it's harder for them, because it's not like, if they say really stranger things in Spanish, they're not, it's gonna be hard to find like a direct correlation of like money uh, generated because of that specific thing. It's more about like volume for them. How many offerings in total can they uh, do? Yeah, great. Cool. All right. Looks like that's about it. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time.